And then okay. Uh, there is a paper, and uh, these slides are available on my webpage with the address uh, there. Uh, first, uh, I'm really happy that I was invited to come here and speak and, and honor uh, Vitor uh, and his achievements. Uh, we have had many fascinating discussions one on one uh, that I really appreciate, and, and I hope we will continue and have more in, in the future. So my assignment is the future of monetary policy and macroprudential policy. I thought uh, that a sensible approach was to check what Peter has said. <laughs> uh, what has he said about uh, the future of monetary policy and macroprudential uh, policy? Is there anything to add or to disagree with? And he has, in the last year, he has talked at length uh, about these uh, things. Uh, a lecture in Lisb Lisbon a year ago, a recent speech in Frankfurt uh, uh, this month. Uh, Macroprudential policy in Rome in November and in Frankfurt uh, uh, last March. So I read those and then I ran into a problem. <laughs> And the serious problem I have is first, there's hardly anything to add. <laughs> Vitor has covered uh, roughly every possible topic yeah. one could think of. Thank you. <laughs> um, the other thing is, there is hardly anything to disagree with. <laughs> uh, perhaps I'm a bit more favorable towards price level stability. Uh, Vitor is quite skeptic. But I think that's about all. Uh, so so I, I, I face this problem. What I will do is to make a few very selective uh, comments and not try to cover uh, everything. If you want to see everything, you should read these speeches of, of, of Vitus. <laughs> so on monetary policy, I will take the liberty of suggesting some clarification of the ECB's objective and the interpretation uh, of without prejudice to price stability. And uh, I actually propose that uh, the ECB's objective could be phrased as price stability and full employment without prejudice to price stability. Instead of full employment, you could say maximum sustainable uh, employment or full resource utilization or real stability. With the proper explanation, it means for practical purposes the same thing. But the interesting thing is, uh, without prejudice to the objective pr of price stability, how to make an operational uh, definition of that. I think we should just think of average inflation over a longer period being close to target, like a five-year average inflation close to target. If that is the case, then there is no prejudice to price stability. Also, I think it's time to have the modify the qualitative definition slightly and have a symmetric 2% inflation target. I also suggest somewhat more explicit forecast targeting. Uh, in practice, it would in involve the staff uh, forecasts uh, being done for several alternative policy rate paths and, and, and publish those as a menu, menu of choices. Uh, for the governing council, I would love to see the governing council trying uh, the FOMC's summary of economic projections and dot plots. I think that would be very interesting. Uh, I say a few things about financial stability as an objective for monetary policy. You can deal with that very quickly if you, as I believe in the assumption our starting point that economic policies should only have goals that they can achieve. Since monetary policy cannot achieve financial stability, hence it should not have financial stability as one of the objectives. Uh, I also say something about a very interesting Swedish example of monetary policy leaning against the wind and the dramatic turnaround a few years 
uh, go. Uh, something, a summary about cost-benefit analysis of law, which has interested me a lot. And importantly, Vitor has done an update of this cost-benefit analysis for uh, the euro area, showing that also for the euro area, the costs are much larger than the benefits. And perhaps even more importantly, he has done a cost-benefit analysis for macroprudential policy and shown that there the benefits exceed uh, the uh, costs uh, in, in, in one case for a substantial margin. So that is uh, quite interesting and it's one of the, in, in one of these speeches. On macroprudential policy, I discuss uh, or repeat the arguments for why I think they are different, very different and should be kept separate. Uh, I say a bit about the objective of macroprudential uh, policy. And then uh, I go on to the importance of distinguishing between good and bad credit. I think that's a difficult and important problem in macroprudential policy. And I actually turn to another Swedish example, uh, the current example of macroprudential policy uh, trying to prevent uh, credit growth. Uh, with arguably the FSA not being able to provide a good case for what they, they are doing. I think this is relevant for other economies where authorities worry about the growth and level of debt and, and, and housing prices. So in the limited time I have, I will actually only talk about this last point, uh, distinguishing good and bad credit and the Swedish example. Uh, the importance of distinguishing good and bad credit. Of course, not preventing bad credit growth. That may have large costs, we know that very well. But of course, preventing good credit growth may also have large costs, considerable welfare and distributional uh, costs if you prevent people from buying the home they would like to have. Also, when you look at the data, only a third or a quarter, depending on the sample, of credit booms end in a crisis. Most credit booms are not so bad. Bad credit, what is it? Well, it's excessive relative to fundamentals. It's due to market failures, too low lending standards, insufficient debt service capacity and resilience of borrowers, exuberance, overvalued housing, and so on. Good credit is consistent with fundamentals, rising incomes and demand for housing, sustained falls in interest rates, appropriate lending standards, sufficient debt service capacity and resilience of borrowers, realistic expectations, reasonably valued housing, and so on. The problem is to distinguish the two. And the practical problem in Sweden is that the Swedish FSA <coughs> which is in charge of a macroprudential policy in Sweden, is trying to prevent household debt growth. But when you look at their case, it's, it's a little shaky. However, much is very good with Swedish macroprudential policy. The FSA has been very active uh, and done a lot of things. Uh, a series of actions to make sure that the banks are well capitalized. Currently, uh, capital to risk weighted assets is about 24%, 22% common equity tier one. And the banks are extremely resilient in, in, in stress tests. I mean, they are among the most resilient or the most resilient in the European Union. Uh, the, the FSA is called Finansinspektionen, abbreviated FI in Sweden, but I prefer to call it the FSA in English. They have a commendable mortgage market report, which has, which using individual data uh, on households to do stress tests on households. There's not only stress tests on banks, there's also stress, stress tests on households done by the FSA. And the households have substantial and over time increasing debt service capacity and resilience 
to disturbances like house price falls, interest increases and income losses due to unemployment. There is an LTV cap of 85% on new mortgages. The average LTV for new mortgages is 63%. Uh, and uh, for the total stock of mortgages, it's 55%, pretty reasonable values. There is a structural problem in the housing market. Uh, demand is increasing because of rapid urbanization, rising incomes, falling mortgage rates, lack of a functional rental market due to rent control. Supply is insufficient because of restrictions on land use, building regulations, regional planning problems. So housing prices and debt have risen precisely what we would expect in this situation. Here is a graph of uh, uh, housing prices, disposable income and mortgage rates, uh, everything indexed to 100 in 2008. Uh, we see that disposable income has increased by almost 50%. Uh, housing prices has increased, have increased more, but the interest rates have come down quite a bit. The blue is a 10-year interest rate. Here is uh, price over income. Uh, by the way, there is a stock flow issue here. Stocks overflows are problematic. Prices over income, debt over income. Stocks over stocks, LTVs, or flow over flows over flows, debt service to income, uh, user cost, housing cost to income are uh, much better. Uh, anyhow, here we see price over income, uh, also indexed to 100 in 2008. They have price over income has gone up, but here we see interest expenditures. Uh, the product of uh, interest rates and housing prices, they have actually gone, don't gone down uh, relative to uh, disposable income. Uh, those measures are kind of interesting. That's kind of a simple uh, interest cost of housing or a capital cost of housing or a user cost of housing. Uh, if people have Cobb Douglas preferences, the user cost of housing should be a given fraction of their consumption. And, and uh, if their consumption is stable relative to disposable income, it should be a reasonable, a stable fraction of disposable income. Here in Sweden, they have fallen. Okay, um, the FSA is worried because debt to income uh, has risen and is now 1.8 times uh, uh, disposable income. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, financial assets which are higher, we have real assets, that is housing, that is higher, and total assets are now 6.7 times disposable income. And then there is an additional large collective pension claim, which is not in there, which is maybe 1.5 or 1.7 times uh, disposable income. So assets are really high relative to, to, to debt. And then here is another measure of interest expenditures over income published by the Riksbank. And as you see now, the interest rate ratio is really low, historically low, down at 2 to 3 uh, percent. Okay, the FSA is nevertheless worried about household debt growth and housing prices. It tries to reduce household debt growth above income growth by effectively tightening lending standards and thereby re reducing credit supply. It introduced amortization requirements in June 2016 and again uh, recently, it has induced or at least welcomed tighter lending standards of the banks. Banks have uh, applied pretty high interest rates, 7% in their discretionary income calculations. And they also apply new or lowered internal uh, debt to income uh, caps. These tighter lending standards now exclude 84% 84, 84 of 25 to 29 year old individuals in Stockholm from borrowing 85% of the value of an average studio in Stockholm. 
Here, uh, what we see is the income distribution in Stockholm, the cumulative income distribution. Before, uh, one can calculate that uh, salary, monthly salary of 26,000 was enough uh, to, to, to just borrow uh, uh, to, pay, to, to buy this studio. Uh, the the, the uh, euro uh, rate is about 10, so it's easy. It's, so that's 2,600 euros uh, per month. Uh, then 55% of these young people had income below that level and could not borrow. Now, with the new standards, uh, it's about 30, you need to uh, have about 36,000 Swedish kroner. And that means about 84% have less income, so they cannot borrow and buy uh, this average studio. Uh, then, then they have to go to the rental market. And the uh, primary rental market is a disaster, not functioning because of rent control. Then they have to go to the secondary uh, rental market with very high interest rates. Okay, um, but the FSA, I think, has some difficulties making a case. There is no or little risk to uh, financial stability. The FSA's judgment is that the financial stability risks associated with household debt are relatively small. I'm quoting. This is because the mortgage holders generally have good possibilities to continue to pay their interest and amortization. Also, if interest rates rise or incomes fall. The households have also on average good margins to manage a fall in housing prices. In addition, the Swedish banks are judged to have satisfactory capital buffers if credit losses nevertheless would materialize. Instead, the FSA argues that there is an elevated macro risk. Uh, Instead, the risk presented associated with households that mainly concern that highly indebted households may reduce their consumption substantially if either interest rates rise or incomes fall. And this might reinforce a future economic downturn. So uh, high and rising debt to income ratios uh, therefore imply an elevated macroeconomic risks. This is the argument. Okay, uh, first on the interest sensitivity of consumption. Of course, it's right that the household's cash flows are more interest sensitive with more debt. Also in Sweden, we have a high fraction of variable rates. But interest rates, they are endogenous, not exogenous. In bad times, interest rates are lower, cash flow is better. This is very different from the 90s crisis when we had a fixed exchange rate and a recession and high interest rates. Now with uh, inflation targeting, it's the other way around. Actually, high debt and variable interest rates provide insurance against bad times. It's like an automatic stabilizer, if you like. Also, there is a stronger cash flow channel in monetary policy. It's easier for the Riks Bank to stabilize consumption and aggregate demand, and you need smaller policy rate changes to have the same effect on aggregate demand. So maybe the risk for recessions uh, actually may rather fall than, than rise when you take this into account. On the income sensitivity of uh, consumption, the FSA has referred to three studies of the experience in Denmark, the UK, and the US. But when you read these studies, they, counter, uh, they contradict the FSA. A great paper on Denmark using essentially the whole Danish population as, as uh, data. It's, so it's not a sample, it's actually uh, all, the whole population more or less. Our results do not support any interpretation of the data that impulse, involves a negative causal effect on high debt level or high debt level on subsequent consumption growth. Baker, a great paper coming out in the uh, Journal of Political Economy, that has little or no independent relationship with the income elasticity of spending, when controlling for liquidity and the ability of households to access credit. 
The primary reason consumption responses are higher among highly indebted households are credit and liquidity constraints. Tighter lending standards increase credit and liquidity constraints. They may cause the problems that they are supposed to solve. Anyhow, uh, this has been, uh, so, so as far as I can see, when you look closer at, uh, at uh, the, the issue, the consumption that fell in Denmark, the UK and the US was to a large extent or mainly unsustainable over consumption financed by debt increases, mortgage equity withdrawals. Uh, they could not continue when the crisis came, so therefore the overconsumption had to fall. This shows up in low savings rates. So if you have an indication of unsustainable overconsumption in your economy, financed by mortgage equity withdrawals, then there is a problem, reason to worry. But there is no evidence of un an unsustainable overconsumption in Sweden. Uh, and the FSA says, say themselves that uh, despite optimistic expectations and high margins between income expenses, uh, within income and expenses, households are currently being relatively cautious. Uh, the saving rate is high and has increased and the consumption of durable goods is in line with historical average. So there you see the historically high savings rates we have in Sweden, uh, and, uh, and uh, also consumption of durables is a little below average. Uh, this has been debated in, in Sweden, and uh, the Director General in an op-ed finally said that household debt is still increasing faster than their income, and housing prices are still high. Consequently, the need for action remains. But that seems to imply that all debt growth above income growth is bad. And, and that doesn't make sense to me. It's natural uh, when housing prices have risen, uh, only a fraction of housing stock is turned over at higher prices each year. So debt growth will lag housing price growth for many years. And housing prices are hardly overvalued and households are hardly over leveraged. Anyhow, the consequences of this, you get a large difference between uh, housing payments and user cost. And this large difference is a large involuntary saving. Debt service to income ratios become extremely front loaded. Uh, I already said the income uh, distribution, the income, uh, uh, the distributional effects. And those excluded may have to go to the secondary rental market. And you can argue that households' resilience are actually lower with uh, amortization requirements. Fixed payments is a higher, becomes a higher share of income. And also households have to save in the form of more housing equity instead uh, of in a portfolio of financial liquid assets which facilitate consumption smoothing and maybe increases reliance. Here, I don't have too much time left here, but uh, here is uh, the large difference between housing payment and user cost. Uh, remember, the Swedish euro rate is about 10. So this is what you have to pay uh, if you, monthly payments if you buy this studio. Uh, a fee to the uh, cooperative, uh, the normal uh, ownership form for apartments in Stockholm, and then you pay uh, interest after taxes, and then you pay amortization. The actual user cost, which is the fee to the cooperative, it's the real, uh, the real uh, housing, uh, the real mortgage payments after tax. And the cost of own capital is quite low, only uh, 260 euros uh, uh, per, per, per month. The difference is a large saving, involuntary saving, that this, these young people have to do, which makes little sense. If they can't afford this, then they have to move to the secondary rental market, where rents are now 10,000 kroner per month. And then, of course, the housing payment and the user cost are the same, and there is no involuntary saving. Also, what happens 
one should remember there is an automatic amortization. If you have 2% growth and 2% inflation, uh, it says four per, there is an automatic 4% amortization in the sense that then disposable income grow by 4% and uh, housing prices also probably grow by 4%. So that means that LTVs and debt service to income half, half in, in, in 18 years without amortization for an interest-only loan. If you uh, look there, start out with 85%, after 18 years you have 42.5% LTV. That's pretty good. Uh, would the optimal amortization rate be faster than this? I'm, I'm not sure. Anyhow, uh, if you don't have an amortization, the debt service uh, would follow this blue uh, debt service to income would follow this blue curve uh, pretty smooth over time. With amortization requirements introduced, you actually have to pay over 50% of your uh, disposable income in in uh, amortization. They, they they come down. But anyhow, let me let me conclude here. I think it's important to distinguish good and bad credit growth, and I think one should have a good case if one imposes uh, uh, these kind of restrictions that we have talked about. Uh, and we all know it's very costly not to prevent bad growth, but it is also costly to prevent good growth. So we need to distinguish them. And we require expertise in housing economics, the housing market, and household finance. And also, housing markets and mortgage markets, they are very different in different countries. You cannot, uh, you, no easy generalization. You can't just look at another country and draw conclusions about your own. You have to look at each economy uh, uh, de uh, deeply to understand what is going on. And I think you need uh, support of a cost-benefit analysis including welfare and distributional effects, a cost-benefit analysis of the kind that, uh, that Vitor uh, is doing in, 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 in one of his uh, papers. And also, what we have in Sweden is a fundamentally structural problem, uh, rising housing demand and insufficient supply. Tighter lending standards, reducing credit supply is not uh, uh, the right solution to that. Of course, increasing housing supply would be, would be the correct solution. Always use the right policy for a given problem. It's easy said, sometimes not so easy done. Okay, there are also governance issues uh, uh, that I could talk about. I think uh, a committee is arguably less likely to make mistakes than a single decision maker. Uh, and I also think we need mechanisms for evaluation and accountability in macroprudential policy. And we can actually use the government governance experience from monetary policy. We know a lot about governance in monetary policy and how to set up accountability mechanisms and, and evaluate uh, monetary policy. We should apply those uh, same to, to uh, macroprudential policy. And of course, we have, we have already some experience of how it works at Bank of England with their financial policy committee and, and uh, their hearings and so on. So there I think um, we should remember macroprudential policy is a very new policy. When we compare to economics, we have an enormous amount of experience when it comes to monetary policy. And, uh, and also monetary policy is arguably the simplest of all economic policy. It's a simple objective, simple instruments, well understood transmission mechanism. <coughs> We are on much looser ground, and we have much less experience when we talk about macroprudential policy. But I think there are quite a few things, experiences from monetary policy that we can apply in macroprudential uh, policy, for instance, regarding governance, and also make sure that we have the right accountability and, and minimize the risk of mistakes. Let me end there. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, Lars. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm in overtime, but I'm also in Germany, so the football players know you can still uh, have calls in uh, overtime. So. Uh, 
Uh, Peter, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially because you've been leading the work on macroprudential policy at the ECB, including your uh, drive to not only look at resilience, but also at financial imbalances. And I think we are there in a minority, but um, I hope you keep it up in your blog. Um, so, we have a very rich paper of uh, Lars uh, on monetary policy on macroprudential. The first bit is on monetary policy, and uh, we, had an, uh, we didn't discuss it, but we both agreed uh, implicitly to focus on the second part. I will be very short on the monetary policy. Um, I only note that we are far away from when the ECB started, the monetary and the economic pillar, and we only talk about the economic pillar now. Um, when I read about what we are doing, information on the economy, economic activity, transmission mechanism, uh, I agree that financial stability should not be a goal of uh, monetary policy itself. However, what I really miss is uh, that the banking and the financial system is crucial uh, for uh, monetary policy. If you don't understand it, then you miss a lot. So we have to be careful with all our inflation targeting that we uh, forget about the importance of the banking and the financial uh, system. And we discussed at the start of the afternoon the role of banking capital and that kind of thing. Yu Shin has written on it. Moving on to the, the main topic. Um, um, different, separate um, from monetary policy, and then we need to have different instruments, the famous Tin Bergen rule, the first Nobel Prize winner, and I'm lucky to be at Erasmus University where he uh, studied, and he has this famous quote, the profit comes from the distribution, that's the quote I see each day if I enter the building. Um, but this is, I think, very sensible. So if we really want to stay financial stability, we need separate instruments. Separate decision-making bodies, I also agree. But then how to organize? I will come back to that. And um, the big issue is, what I already said, is it only resilience? And that's what I hear, especially among central bankers, as the main thing. Or should uh, macroprudential policy also uh, target, uh, moderate the financial cycle? Uh, and I strongly believe uh, yes, uh, but I'm in a minority. So let's, uh, I will show you some graphs. The next thing is, can we distinguish between good and bad credit growth? That shows already that central banking is an art, because that is extremely difficult. And uh, I think that's a key issue. And the new ID uh, Lars puts forward is, let's take an interest cost or an interest expenditure to income ratio, rather than uh, the, the current price to income ratio. And if we knew this new measure, then everything looks fine. Um, but is that a good idea? That's the question I would like to put to you. So, first on the separation. Uh, so, I'm uh, educated a bit in the Dutch tradition, but also in the, the British tradition. And uh, in both traditions, we look at monetary and financial stability as two sides of the same coin. Uh, and, and financial stability has always been in the remit of the Dutch Central Bank and, and, and the Bank of England. And the big uh, overlap is the, the role of the financial system, which is relevant for both sides. They're both macro, they are about the system. Um, and finally, you need independence. So if you think there is an issue with imbalances, and if you need to stop imbalances, we all know if you are linked to the political cycle, you're always too late uh, in the game because politicians, uh, uh, they like the voters, so you're always too late in the game. So uh, you need an independent uh, authority if you want to be in time, or try to be in time. At the Advisory Scientific Committee at the European Systemic Risk Board, we did a paper, and uh, Andre was also, Andre Sapir was also involved. So the first conclusion we had was quite strongly, it should not be a government or a government agency, and in some countries the supervisor is quite close or even part of the government. Secondly, you really need uh, the macroeconomic uh, 
uh, focus and in a paper uh, 16 years back with, with Charles we looked at the, the, the type of staff at central banks at supervisors and then we found very strongly that supervisors micro supervisors had far more lawyers uh, accountants and only a minority of uh, economists and look for example at the sec in in the us is a very clear example they did prudential policy of investment banks but they didn't do anything because they didn't understand it and central banks on the other side they have a bunch of economists and that is the leading culture so if we think macroprudential is macro-oriented, you need an economic focused body to be successful. And my favorite is um, uh, the Bank of England, it's a pity that uh, Mark left, um, with two separate bodies, on that I fully agree with Lars, but then uh, both at the central bank where you have the micro, uh, the macro uh, focus. Now to the objective, so my main uh, issue. Uh, so, only resilience, not imbalances, and to be truthful to, to Lars, he mentions excessive credit growth, that he agrees with that, that we should address that. And in a recession, interest rates are low, so if we get a recession and a financial crisis, then interest rates are low, so anyway, then it's less a problem that assumes that the business and the financial cycle are related. And I will show you in a minute that is not always the case. And you have this tendency that if you see uh, that you find the problems at the structural side, and I'm not saying they are not there, but uh, lack of housing supply. This lack of housing supply was also there uh, during the recession, only people knew they couldn't buy a house. They wanted the house, but they couldn't buy it. So this lack of housing supply is not unique, only people have now money and want to uh, buy a house. So, and remember Greenspan, the new economy, this new economy is completely different because the structure of the economy is new, uh, different because of the internet. And then uh, a few years later, uh, when the internet bubble burst, we found out that the business cycle was still alive. Uh, and we thought for, uh, earlier with the new economy that the business cycle was not there anymore. And I would call this, uh, the this time is different fallacy, that if you are an observer in the current time, that's always more difficult to, to take an, a distant picture, and that you have a tendency to, to say that today is unique. So today credit growth is fine. And uh, in the past it was wrong, but this time uh, the high house prices are fine and credit growth is fine. So, however, the financial system is known to have become extremely pro-cyclical and not really related to the business cycle. So it is not to say in a financial crisis, interest rates will easily come down and no problem. So I take two elements from that. So I would say there is really a need to dampen, uh, to moderate the financial cycle, like we moderate the business cycle with monetary policy and fiscal policy. And I think in the earlier sessions that has been extremely clear, there is a strong feedback loop from the financial system to consumption. And there's an extremely strong um, effect, which I will also show you. So we're now coming to the graphs to keep you awake. Um, the first time when I showed this picture, this, you all know it from Claudio Borio. The business cycle is red, the, the financial cycle is blue. That is housing prices and credit, which are of course correlated. When I showed it uh, back in the Netherlands, my colleagues of the free universities thought, oh, D Dirk is wrong. I had the source, BIS, so they looked it up. And the picture is true. First, the cycles are not related. Second, um, uh, business cycle policy is second order financial cycle policy is first order. I mean, that's quite clear uh, from, this, from this picture. So not to wish to moderate the financial cycle would be uh, really a pity. Um, and I did, together with uh, Peter Wietz at the Dutch Central Bank, some simulations that, uh, like in the earlier papers at the start of the afternoon, that the level of equity, in Dutch it is eigen vermogen, the level of equity matters. So the, the, the blue one is with 10% equity, then you have a moderate mortgage credit cycle. If you go to 5%, where we are today, 
you are already a bit uh, worse. If you are at 2 or 3 percent, like before the crisis, then you get uh, a huge cycle. And we, we looked for a long time what was really driving it. And in the end, the answer was extremely simple. The profit maximizing behavior of banks. So uh, in good times, you earn more on your assets than on your debt, the leverage. And in bad times, you earn uh, less on your assets than in debt. So the bigger leverage, the lower equity, the stronger this incentive to maximize your profit. So the really the, the normal behavior, nothing to do with greed or with, uh, uh, with uh, wrong things. It's just a normal commercial behavior of a commercial bank. Um, and for the instruments that shows that higher equity is not only useful for micro purposes, but would also dampen the cycle, uh, in addition to loan to value and other measures. Now to housing and consumption. That's my last point, and then uh, we can all go to uh, dinner. Um, so the blue one, the light blue one, is house prices. They fall. And then you see consumption also going down. And why do I show this one? Uh, this is the Netherlands. Uh, in 2011, 2012, we were really thinking, what is going on? The economy keeps on going down uh, because of government spending cuts and all kinds of things. And, and we didn't know what was happening. If you look at this picture, in 2011, uh, the light blue is Germany. Mm -hmm. This is about consumer expectations, and we know if consumers are happy, they spend. If they are not happy, they don't spend. And you see this 2011 really rock bottom thing, and it's really related to the housing. One out of six households had negative equity. In Germany, you all know it. People don't own houses, so there was no negative equity, so there was no consumption effect, because our economies are quite similar. We are not as good in uh, handmade industry as Germany, but otherwise we are quite close. Um, but this is really a huge difference. And in the start of the cycle, uh, when house prices were going up, we had higher consumption because we were consuming, like the UK and the US, the overvalue in our houses. So this it's a very strong effect. So I'm not worried about banks. They don't lose money because of full recourse. And uh, it's really the consumption effect of financial instability. And this is really a nice graph, uh, also from Klaas uh, uh, Knots people uh, at the Dutch Central Bank. It shows uh, at the y-axis you have uh, the correlation between house prices and consumption. And at the x axis you have uh, home ownership. So the more home ownership you have, like in the UK, in the US, in the Netherlands, then you get a really strong correlation between house prices and, cor uh, and, cor and consumption. If you don't have this, re if you don't have, if you have low home ownership, then you don't have at all uh, this relationship. So that's why in Germany it is not an issue. And in uh, uh, high uh, home ownership countries, and I think Sweden is part of that, you have this, um, uh, the, this connection. And I think that fits in at the start of the afternoon where we really say we have to look at the heterogeneity, the differences between countries. And, and this is a strong one. And that shows that it's very dangerous um, to, to, to ignore this channel. And concluding, so we have full agreement with last separate objectives, but uh, the financial system is connecting the two, and that's why uh, uh, the banking and the financial system is always very close to the central bank, the only one who gets uh, liquidity support if needed and not the wider economy. If you want to dampen financial imbalances, you need a macro approach, a micro approach wouldn't do. And Sweden looks fine on this uh, static interest expenditure to income ratio. Like all countries look fine on the government debt on the current low interest rates. What happens if interest rates uh, go up? What happens? Or we wouldn't increase, as Charles said, interest rates because we would get insolvency. So we are 
in a trap then. And uh, at least in the Netherlands, to conduct a business supervisor doing a dual test, can you pay your mortgage today? And can you pay your mortgage at a fixed rate of 5%? And only when you meet both tests, you can get the mortgage. And that's far more sensible than calculating with today's cheap money. And then interest uh, mortgages are cheap. Mm -hmm. You can buy a huge house. And if you have this 5%, then interest rates can change without coming into difficulties. And, and that is one mechanism. And if we will do that, then I think Sweden and Amsterdam with uh, 15 percent uh, increase in house prices for three years and nothing happens, uh, then uh, it looks less rosy, the picture. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Wow. A lot to discuss and, and not much time.